My name's Ryan, and this is an evening at the improv. Sometimes people like to play a little game called what's your most embarrassing moment. I found usually that people like to think about that answer for a while. I never need a second. It's not even close. For the, for the last 13 years, I've been a stand-up comic. I've toured the US for 11 of those years. If you were ever to chat with a working stand-up and ask them to tell you about a time they bombed on stage, even the best, most accomplished comedians will have no shortage of stories to share with you. Most of us can tell you about a time that we were booed, heckled, or even attacked on stage. My story makes even my most accomplished friends cringe. When I was 17, I snuck my high school girlfriend into the improv comedy club in my hometown. The first time I've ever stepped foot into an honest-to-goodness, real-life comedy club. We watched John Panette and a lineup of absolute murderers that had us both in stitches. Although, truth be told, these days I'd probably just sit there like seething and like making fun of them for, out of pure spite. Anyway, that night, watching my high school crush beside herself with laughter, I decided stand-up was something I wanted to pursue. It took leaving that town for San Diego, which is here, by the way, uh, and five more years of cowardice before becoming a comedian at the age of 23. To my surprise, I excelled relatively quickly. Within months, I was a regular at some local comedy clubs and indie shows, opening for people I'd seen on TV shows like Last Comic Standing, and building a modest reputation amongst peers and audiences. When you're young and you experience even the tiniest bit of success at anything, and believe me, this was the most tiniest bit of success, I was making zero dollars. <laughs> it's easy to develop delusions of grandeur. Delusions of like, how far could this go? Am I gonna be a star in a couple years? <laughs> but I had one immediate goal, one, to return to my hometown and perform at the Improv Comedy Club in front of everyone I grew up with. Unfortunately for me, the Improv is an A-list comedy club that hosts top tier and more importantly, recognizable talent. Celebrities that got their start in stand-up before graduating to movies and television played the improv circuit. Thank you. <laughs> hey honey, it's not TV, I can hear you. So no matter how well I was doing at local shows in front of audiences of upwards of 19 people, at classy establishments like Lou's Famous Sports Pub and Steaks, at their world-renowned comedy night and dart tournament, the improv was not returning my phone call and emails. Eager to live out my, my hometown boy makes good fantasy and not wanting to wait for the years it seemed it was gonna take to do so, I aimed my sights a little lower and started seeking out less prestigious venues. A bevy of bar gigs followed in my hometown. In line with my original plan, every time I secured a booking back home, I called every friend, classmate, teammate, crush, and acquaintance I'd ever met to invite them to see my triumphant return home. In every correspondence, I'd hear the question that would absolutely pulverize me. When are you playing the improv? A normal, well-adjusted person might have been able to admit, well, I'm just not there in my career yet, and people who perform there are just more successful than I am right now, but it would mean a lot to me if you'd come see me in this new endeavor I'm pursuing at Mike's Tavern and Billboard or whatever. <laughs> However, a normal, well-adjusted person, a good stand-up, does not make. <laughs> my fragile ego would not allow for my former friends to know that I had not already achieved the success I was only dreaming about at this point. To them, or in my head at least, m mainly in my head, I was already minor league famous. This should be no problem. Simply a comedy club should be no problem for a big shot like me to secure a mere stepping stone on my way to theaters and arenas with comedy god himself, Dane Cook. <laughs> Just in case you need a timestamp of when this all took place. So, with a staggering lack of shame and no moral compass, call after call, I would lie and say something to the effect of, yes, yeah, soon, I'm going to be there soon. Um, my, my agent's in talks with them. It's a money thing, you understand. 
I should mention at this point, when this story takes place, I was years from signing with my first agent. At the time, my agent was me calling places as my own agent in a very problematic voice. The less said about that, the better. My plan to feign success backfired. My assertion that I was not only, I not, not only had Hollywood representation, I didn't, but I also was a mere stone's throw from making my debut at my hometown's premier comedy club caused everyone to say, oh, I'll wait till you play the improv then. Call me when you play the improv. Years passed, years. I was in my fourth year of stand-up with hundreds of shows and road gigs and even a TV appearance under my belt. And then I got my wish. And boy, I wish I hadn't. There was a comedy competition happening locally. If you made it to the final round, which would take months of advancement, by the way, every one of the finalists would take away a prize. First prize was $1,500. Second, $500. The money got smaller from there, with the last prize being a consolation prize. A booked gig at the Improv Comedy Club in my hometown. I made it to the final round. I intentionally tanked the last night so I could get the last prize. <laughs> it's easy for me to say that I intentionally tanked. The guy who won went on to be famous and successful. So that's kind of like me saying that I intentionally threw a fight against Joe Frazier in his prime. Yeah, I took a dive. But I digress. I had it. I was going to the improv. Finally, my night came. I was back in my hometown at the first comedy club that I'd ever stepped foot in. And it was filled to the cheap seats with my high school alma mater, including the date that I'd brought there years ago. I know, because I invited her. <laughs> I wasn't trying to rekindle any type of romance. I just needed her to see, I just needed to see her laugh from the stage, the way she did that night. I needed to see that. After four years of working stages all over the Southwest, typically speaking, I no longer had any like, nerves before a show. I'd done this 500 times at this point. I'd crushed and bombed, failed and succeeded, bested hecklers. I was ready. But the nervous energy I had, I hadn't felt since I was an open mic comic, it returned in spades that night. I sweated profusely. My left leg trembled with adrenaline. This was the moment I'd been building up and working towards for literally half my adult life. These next 10 minutes were going to define me. I heard the MC say the words I'd been anticipating and dreading all week. Shores, the guy on, on stage, he got the light. You're up in two minutes. Hyperventilation, adrenaline. You fucking got this. You fucking got this. Make, it, make them laugh until it hurts. Then the MC spoke to me again. Wait, Shores, you're bumped. We have a pop in. I should explain, being bumped on a comedy show doesn't necessarily mean you're off the show. I super wish it had. It would have humiliated me, but not as bad as what was to come. To be bumped means a more successful comic, usually a celebrity that's been in movies or television, has shown up, and decide he does not want to wait in line. He'll be going on stage now. He'll be doing as much time as he wants, and you'll go on after he's decided he's finished. It's the nature of the business. My celebrity comic had recently been in a hit movie called Tropic Thunder. The audience gasped. Yeah, that reaction. They gave that reaction. The audience gasped as it was announced, and he made his way to the stage. Okay. Just so you guys aren't spending the rest of my story wondering who it was, clearly it was Tom Cruise. <laughs> I'm kidding, it was this guy. Yeah, the least famous person in that movie steamrolled right over me. Don't even worry about it. And the thrill and excitement in that room was palpable. He proceeded to do an hour of material as my adrenaline waned. At the end of his set, in good performer fashion, he yelled, thank you, good night, and dropped the mic to the stage. <laughs> the audience went berserk. People signed their checks, and they got up to leave. 
The MC rushed the stage. Wait, 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 everyone, 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 wait. There's still one more comic left. They didn't hear her. Who could blame them? A character from a hit movie just surprised them 15 feet from their seat, and it was all included in the price of their $15 ticket. To have an MC plead with you to come down from that high, sit your ass back down for 10 more minutes to hear some guy you've never heard of do 10 more minutes to close out the show must have been a very bizarre proposition. <laughs> It'd be like if Metallica did their final encore of the night and then the house arena lights came on and then someone over the PA started pleading, wait, 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 stop. The guy that used to play drums in Everclear in 2001 is here. And he'd really like to play you some songs on his acoustic guitar. <laughs> Just give him a chance. I was that guy. <laughs> My name was called. No one cheered. No one applauded. It was a far cry from the standing ovation I thought I'd get. I got on stage to see a crowd of people still talking and buzzing about what they'd just seen. And the people that did notice me, they just looked confused. I was three jokes in before anyone realized I was on stage. And then, silence. The act I'd cultivated and done in dozens of cities across the US for the last four years was getting nothing. And it was hitting with a thud. Not a single laugh. It was like performing for a small auditorium of like cigar store Indians. I knew where my friends and old high school girlfriend were all sitting. I got them their tickets. I conveniently never faced that direction of the house. After stammering and sweating through quite literally the longest 10 minutes of my life, before now, <laughs> I left the stage to what only can be described as a smattering of golf claps. Peppered across the room. I charged the stage, I'm, I'm sorry, I charged the exit. The producer called out to me, wait, your check. Keep it, I called over my shoulder. I didn't want their $50. It wasn't that I was taking some moral, artistic high ground. It's just that no amount of money was worth facing those people. I ran to my car and I drove 80 miles an hour back towards San Diego, my new home. Old home was dead now. During the drive, I endured a battery of texts that ranged from consoling to condescending. Hey, bud, where'd you go? We uh, wanted to see you after the show. Listen, um, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> look, man, hey, look, it takes guts to just get up there. You know, I couldn't do it. And my favorite, hey, man, shut up, man. You'll find something you're good at someday. My dream to be, <laughs> I'm sorry, I crawled into bed when I got home and I didn't leave my room for three days. My dream to be the hometown hero had failed and it had failed in magnificent fashion. At this point, one might see this as a tragic story, a complete and total loss. It's not. It's a story that every live performer needs, not only to humble them, but to fortify them. To this day, I wear this story around my neck like a good luck charm that protects me from future pain and anxiety. In 13 years of stand-up, there's one question I get more than any other. Aside from whatever happened to that Dane Cook fella, <laughs> I wrote this a week before that news dropped. <laughs> Very unfortunate. Didn't know what a monkey business that guy was up to. And that question that I get, other than the thing cook thing, is how do you not get nervous? People always ask that. How do you not get nervous on stage? They always share with me how they could never get on a stage in front of people and just try to be funny. They share their insecurities and their phobias about standing in front of a crowd and risking the chance of looking foolish, leaving them feeling humiliated and alone. There's many long answers to that question that vary from comic to comic. My answer is, 
because I've already failed in ways you can't imagine. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I'm Ryan Shores. Ryan Shores, everybody. Ryan Shores.